to you. Sir, I don't know anything. I'm going to ask you right now again. Are there any other bodies no. in your backyard? Not that I didn't even know that one was there. When we think of serial killers, our minds picture scary men or women armed with knives and torture chambers who enjoy the thrill of taking another life. Dorothea Puente did not fit that image. Portraying herself as a charitable old lady, she ran a boarding house and took in those in need. However, the sudden disappearances of her tenants raised suspicions among the neighbors and the authorities. When investigators paid her a visit, they came face to face with reality. The charming old lady had seven bodies buried in the backyard of her Victorian house. After a life of lies and deception, Dorothea Puente showed her true self. She was a serial killer. Dorothea Helen Gray did not have a happy childhood. She was born on January 9, 1929, in Redlands, California, and was a sixth of seven children. Her father was a cotton picker, but he was also a depressed alcoholic who never took care of his children. Her mother was a sex worker and also had an addiction to alcohol, which made her neglect her children. Before Dorothea turned 10, both her parents had passed away, her father from tuberculosis and her mother from a motorcycle accident. So Dorothea and her siblings were sent to an orphanage. During her early teens, she was moved around different foster homes and relatives' house. But at the age of 16, she went her own way and became a sex worker herself to make some money. This is how she met Fred McFall a 22-year-old soldier who became her first husband in 1945. A year later, Dorothea had her first daughter, and a second daughter a year after that. However, both babies were given up for adoption, as Dorothea had no desire to take care of children. By 1948, her husband left her and Dorothea moved to San Bernardino. This is where she began her criminal record. She was arrested for trying to cash a fake check, for which she got four months of jail time. After being released, she violated her probation by leaving the county and moving to Sacramento with her new husband, Johansson, in 1952. Over the next ten years, the couple would have several falling outs, especially ignited by Dorothea's gambling, drinking, and the fact that she hadn't told her husband she was still a sex worker. In fact, she was arrested in 1960 for running a brothel disguised as a bookkeeping office. In 1961, Johansson had her committed to a psychiatric hospital for her drinking and suicidal behaviour, and doctors put her on antipsychotics. She was diagnosed as a pathological liar and having an unstable personality. And Dorothea was indeed a liar. She constantly made up names, changed her family history, and posed in different jobs to get what she wanted. It was hard to tell what was true and what she was just making up. In 1966, Johansson divorced her, but she continued to use his last name and changed her first name to become Sharon Johansson, a kind caregiver and Christian woman who ran a free rehabilitation centre for addicts. In 1968, Dorothea would marry her third husband, Roberto Puente, whose name she'd keep for 20 years after the divorce only a couple of years into the marriage. After a turbulent and abusive relationship, Roberto Puente fled to Mexico, and Dorothea settled in Sacramento, California, and opened a boarding house at 21st and F Streets. In the 70s, Dorothea Puente was well known in the community for being a charitable woman. Her boarding house was open to those struggling with finances, illnesses, or addictions. She would hold AA meetings to network and meet social workers, whom she developed strong relationships with. Therefore, many social workers referred people to 21st and F Streets to live under the roof of kind and loving Dorothea, who opened her doors to anyone in need. The three-story Victorian house could sleep over two dozen tenants, and Dorothea not only provided a safe roof to sleep under, 
but she also helped those in need request benefits from the state to receive checks and help them get back on their feet. Dorothea was a master of deception. She dressed conservatively, wore large glasses, and because she was missing some of her teeth, she told people she was 10 or 15 years older than she actually was. She was playing the part of the kind-hearted old lady to gain people's trust, and everyone was buying it. And although she was charged in 1978 for trying to cash 34 state and federal checks that belonged to her tenants and given probation as well as a fine, she continued to run the boarding house and take care of her tenants. However, in the early 80s, Dorothea Puente's criminal activity began to shift from forging checks to meddling with human life for money. In 1982, one of Dorothea's tenants died from an overdose. Ruth Monroe was 61 years old, and according to Dorothea, she suffered from depression. The death was ruled a suicide. A few weeks later, a man accused Dorothea of drugging him. According to his testimony, the two had met at a club in Midtown, and she had slipped a sedative into his drink. Then, they had gone to his apartment, by which time the sedative was kicking in, and the man could see how Dorothea searched his things and took his money. For this, Dorothea was convicted for theft and sentenced to five years in jail. While in jail, she was psychologically evaluated and it was determined she was a schizophrenic. It was also during her time in prison when she began corresponding with Everson Gilmuth, a 77-year-old man. In 1985, and despite her evaluation, she was released early for good behaviour and Everson met Dorothea outside the jail. Very soon, the couple decided to get married, but after a few months, Gilmuth disappeared without a trace. Dorothea hired a man to do some home improvement and gave him Gilmuth's truck in exchange. She also asked him to transport a very large and heavy box she said was filled with books and other items she wanted to get rid of at a dumping site. Months later, a man found the box and opened it, to find the decomposing body of an unidentified man. It would take three years for the body to be identified as Gilmuth's. Yeah, what we have here is the location that the Sutter County Sheriff's Office recovered the box containing a unidentified male body on January 1st of 1986. What I'm going to it now is the box location was directly uh, next to that uh, uh, trick of that tree that comes up out of the ground directly in front of us here. And there's a small turnaround area and the box is located it's about next to what appears to be an old couch right about there. During the time he was gone, Dorothea continued to collect his pension checks and wrote to his family telling them he was ill. Despite not being allowed to legally run a business, in 1986 Dorothea opened her second boarding house at 1426 F Street, a two-story house which could sleep up to ten tenants. When visited by her probation officers, she would simply state the people at her home were her friends or her relatives, so there was never any suspicion that she was illegally running a business. Dorothea still kept in touch with social workers, who considered her a kind woman who would accept people in need as tenants. Therefore, her house was always full, mostly with elderly or mentally ill tenants. When they received mail, Dorothea would go through it first and keep the checks they received. She would manage the tenants' benefits and keep a percentage of the money as expenses. Good old Dorothea had taken in a homeless man called Chief, who became a handyman around the house. One day, neighbours began noticing the odd chores Chief was doing for Dorothea. He was digging holes in the backyard. Social workers were also beginning to suspect something wasn't right. Several of Dorothea's tenants would pack up and leave suddenly, without a trace and no way of contact left behind. Dorothea would always have a story to justify the disappearances, such as the family coming to collect the men or women from the home, or that the tenants had just decided to move. 
When the police arrived at the property looking for a disappeared man, Alberto Montoya, who had been reported missing by his social worker, Dorothea stated the man had left recently. However, the details of Montoya's departure's story were unclear, since she changed it many times. Another tenant who was at the home, John Sharp, backed her story up. However, when the officers were leaving, Sharp walked them out and managed to pass a note to one of the officers. A note that read, She's making me lie for her. And so the police began talking to Sharp, who gave them an insight into what it was like to live at 1426 F Street. Your first name is John. Sharp? Mm-hmm. S-H-R-P? Yep. Let's go back to where you thought something was wrong, like you mentioned in there. Kind of, let's rehash over that. Well, you feel uneasy, you mean? Yeah, because I told the, uh, this, this uh, social worker that I had to get away from there because something was wrong in that house. Montoya was not the first tenant to mysteriously disappear. One of the tenants who had an alcohol addiction vanished after Dorothea had given him something to, quote, make him feel better. After that, he was never seen again. Okay, now, what, well, let, tell me about when you last saw Ben. What was going on that led up to him disappearing? Okay, uh, he was a drinker. Got pretty drunk and, and was in his room next to mine. And uh, I had mentioned to Dorothea then I said, now you've got a true alcoholic on your hands. After he's been there drunk about four days, she came down and said she's going to take him upstairs and get him to feel better. And that's the last I ever saw Ben. But the smell of rot soon became apparent in the home. Dorothea claimed there was a problem with the sewers and that dead rats were causing the smell. So then when, how many days later did you go up in the house and you started smelling this awful smell? I'd say four days at the most. Four days later, yeah. you smelled what you thought death. was death. Yeah, was when you asked her about it, what'd she say it was? I didn't ask her. Oh, about you it. just she remembered it. Yeah, but she mentioned the smell herself. What'd she say about it? I said she's trying to get the smell out of, her, out of the room that was coming from the sewers down below. Sharp also talked about the holes dug in the backyard and how some had been covered with concrete. This was enough for the police to pay Dorothea another visit. This time, seeing the soil in the backyard had recently been moved, they asked Dorothea if they could dig around. She didn't oppose. In fact, they described her as helpful. The 59-year-old had the appearance of being in her 70s and portrayed the look of the charming old lady to perfection. When the officers began digging, they quickly found a bone. It seemed to belong to a human leg. Going back, of course, you know how this whole thing got started was because of, of this of the last individual, right. Montoya. Right. Now, his disappearance is very suspicious. I can tell you that. Even the things that you said uh, didn't even quite uh, connect with what the other individual told us when she spoke to you. Well, you know, I didn't think I was ever going to have to remember everything. And but there's just a lot of inconsistencies. Now, as far as uh, uh, the... Uh, the social worker, uh, he had no relatives known to her and never mentioned of any. But he had mentioned at one time that he wanted to move from your place. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to stay there anymore. And uh, then we talked to Mr. Sharp. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Sharp says he hasn't seen him for three months. But you said the other day. Yeah, and the social him. worker hasn't seen him. So who is lying to me? Who is lying to me, Dorothea? Well, I'm not. Well, Mr. Sharp also told us that you had told him to lie. I did not. About saying that he was there because he later told us that I you did told not. him to lie. Dorothea was still not the main suspect since only one bone had been found and these old homes sometimes had remains of old graveyards and family burials in them. However, the rumors of holes being covered with concrete in the garden and the disappearance of several tenants was enough to put an officer on patrol at the home to watch Dorothea. The digging operation began, and by the next morning, the neighbors were roaming around the fence of 1426 F Street. Dorothea explained she hadn't killed anybody, and that the holes had been used to bury excess rubbish she had. Then, she told the officers in charge she was feeling overwhelmed with all the neighbors watching, and asked if she could leave for a few minutes for a coffee with one of her tenants and her nephew at a nearby hotel. Since there was still no evidence against her, and she didn't seem like a threat, they let her go. This moment was captured in this image, Dorothea calmly exiting what minutes later would become much more than just a boarding house. 
Seven bodies were dug up in the property, including Montoya, the man who officers had been looking for when they visited Dorothea. By this point, it was clear that this was not just a case of a missing person. They were potentially facing a serial killer. Investigators went to the hotel to find Dorothea and question her about the bodies, but she had already left the area heading towards Los Angeles. However, she wouldn't make it very far before being recognized. Her face was now on every television news broadcast. Dorothea was arrested, and the long process of her trials began. The remains recovered from the backyard of 1426 F Street were identified. Additionally, after investigating further, the police also accused Dorothea of murdering Ruth Monroe, the tenant whose death was ruled a suicide, and there was also the body found in the river three years earlier, who was finally identified as Everson Gilmuth, the man Dorothea had met while in prison. It was hard to determine the exact cause of death of the victims, since so much time had passed, but traces of several drugs were found in all the bodies, anticonvulsants, antidepressants, antipsychotics, painkillers, and tranquilizers. Most of them also had traces of Dalmain, a sedative for which Dorothea had several prescriptions and refills over the past three years. Since many of the tenants were addicts, it's hard to determine whether the drugs in their system were taken under prescription or forced by Dorothea. Psychiatric evaluations determined Dorothea suffered from antisocial personality disorder. They believed she may have actually began running the boarding house to help people out, but was also trying to get something out of it, hence cashing their checks. The moment any of the tenants stood up against her or refused her help, she began killing them. The trial lasted for months. Over 100 witnesses were called to the stand, and there were thousands of pieces of evidence admitted. Meanwhile, Dorothea showed no emotion. Her eyes were completely empty. She also refused a plea deal that would have saved her from the death penalty if she admitted guilt for the murders. The jury deliberated for almost a full month. After the long process, Dorothea Puente was given life in prison without parole. She was sent to the Central California Women's Facility in December of 1993. For the rest of her life, she continued to say that none of her tenants were killed, but died of natural causes. Despite all the evidence, she stood by her innocence until March of 2011, where she would die of natural causes at the age of 82. As always, thank you for watching this video. I hope you subscribe if you enjoyed it and if you want to watch more videos like this. And you can also follow the back of the archive on Instagram and Twitter to be up to date with the latest videos and new videos coming up.